All right, Joe. Well, let's talk about fighting sin. Uh, I want to get started today by actually uh, looking back at an old infomercial. Did you ever watch infomercials get sucked into that late night TV thing? No, nobody got through the 90s without infomercials. Okay, all right. Then maybe you'll know what I'm talking about. The, I mean, the king of infomercials, we know, was Ron Popeil. And he had this one that stuck uh, where he just said, set it and forget it. And he was trying to sell this uh, rotisserie chicken cooker. <laughs> and so the idea was you take a raw chicken, whole raw chicken, you stick it in this machine, shut the lid, and you set it and forget it. So you just get to press the button, walk away, and then you come back and, and the chicken, this whole chicken is cooked perfectly. It's done. Set it and forget it. It's a great idea. I don't know if it worked. I never you know, bought one, uh, but it seemed like a, a great idea. Uh, all right. Now, why do I bring that up in, in our podcast about fighting sin? Because, Joe, we told guys we're going to give them 10 episodes about how to fight sin, right? But last week, you told me that in Christ, I've experienced a change in kingdoms and that I'm now dead to sin, right? And that it never, no longer has rule over me. So it seems like in the Christian life for a man, it's set it and forget it. We're in this new kingdom. And, but wait, there's more. We also have the Holy Spirit, right? We've got the Holy, we're in a new kingdom. We're dead to sin. We've got the Holy Spirit. Is it set it and forget it for the Christian life? What else are we going to talk about here now that we've said, hey, you're in a new kingdom. Sin is no more. Well, uh, you know, we could jump in and, and I could try to, you know, give some sort of solution to what you've said. But, but honestly, I just want to take up and say, uh, this is the mindset we've described, I think, is the mindset of a lot of Christian men. I think uh, it's, it's, it's not just that it almost sounds like, like that's the formula. Okay. We're in a different kingdom. We have the spirit, we have power. It should take care of itself. But I would push things a little bit further and say a lot of the sermons I've heard over the last 25 years, uh, basically say, look, there's this new identity. Hmm. And if you just can grab hold of your new identity, then somehow all of this sin is just going to start to, to go away in your life. Hmm. And, uh, there's that. And then something else that I grew up with was a kind of just let go, let God kind of uh, spiritual thing too. And so I know from my own life um, that if you would have asked me for most of my Christian journey, what is, what does it look like to battle sin? Like that, that just kind of set it, let it thing would have been my mindset. Just, okay, I've got an identity. Uh, the, the big problem is I've not fully realized what that means. I just need to let go and if I let go, that releases the spirit and then the sin goes away. And so honestly, there's this kind of passiveness that it was characteristic of my approach to sin. And I think it's true of a lot of other guys, because uh, I think you put your, your finger on a, a real problem. Yeah. Passiveness is a great way to put it. We have unfortunately, I think, been convinced that uh, effort is evil, right? That we... Well, if the spirit is in me and if I am trying at all, right, is, am I working against the spirit at all? So I, I, how do we put that together there? We've got the spirit, yet don't we need effort or, or should, you know, should we be passive all the time? Yeah. Uh, and I think we, we guys definitely need to recover the truth that effort does not equate with legalism mm. or self-reliance. Yes. That uh, that actually with the spirit, the way the spirit tends to operate is through ordinary means. You know, he, he works through us using the faculties, the abilities that God has given us in reliance upon God. Yes, but also in obedience to God. Mm -hmm. And so uh, the spirit actually helps us to do the things that God is telling us to do. And the spirit can operate without us feeling. It's not like you have to feel something inner within you when we just step out in faith and do the things that God has told us to be doing, that's keeping in step with the spirit. And so uh, when it yeah. comes to this fight against sin, uh, we've got to realize as we obey, we're going to see the spirit operating in our lives. Yes. Yeah. I think when we tell guys, Hey, you've probably fallen under the spell of being passive when it comes to, if you, you exp explain most guys stance, and posture towards fighting sin. Passivity probably wins the day most of the time. 
Uh, but guys may push back, and I maybe uh, maybe I'd be interested in hearing from you. What does it look like to be passive? How are we passive in the day to day? But some guys would say, "Well, I'm not passive. I mean, look at all the prayer requests that I'm you know bringing to church and to my small group. Like I'm telling you, I'm dealing with sin. I'm asking you to pray for me in that sin. Is that passive or?" Uh, you know, what else do you want from me? You know, I, I'm so saying I struggle with it, asking you to pray for me. Yeah. I mean, like you say, guys aren't, they're not altogether passive, but neither is a priority. Neither mm-hmm. are they investing a lot of positive energy in this. Um, you know, it would almost be like if you think of Ukraine right now, if they were just, you know, you know, send, sending requests to the U.S. to come and fight for them, but that they didn't want to protect their own borders. Um, you know, that's not the way it works. Um, yes, send up the requests, ask for the help that you don't have within and of yourself. But at the same moment, you got to mobilize your troops. And yes. a lot of guys aren't really saying, hey, look, these are the sins. Uh, where, where is the sin coming from? And what does it actually mean to take a defensive stand and to actually aggressively push back and to put it to death in the way that Paul tells us to? Yeah, I've got a buddy actually that uh, rarely submits a prayer request to me, but instead he uses a different language. He's always trying to get me to join in, join with him in his prayer strategy. That's what he calls it. He's like, Evan, I've got a prayer strategy. Would you join me? And I love that, even just that change of language there, uh, because anybody that, look, any coach, any team that wants to fight against an enemy, they've got not just go into their enemy with requests. Can, can you just, you know, you don't go to enemies with requests. You don't go to your opponent and give requests. You go with a strategy, right? And you've got some sort of strategy. Even prayer plays into that, I yeah. think. And uh, so I think even just approaching the way we talk about some of this helps to see, hey, we're being active in some of this. Yeah. Um, so let me bring in then kind of our topic. We've said we're going to give guys 10 rules of war and just ways to think about going out and actually fighting sin. Today, I want us to circle around. You've got to play strong defense if you're going to fight sin. Play strong defense. So outline what you think that means for us. Yeah, so I would take guys uh, to to Romans 6.12, which uh, last week we looked at 6.11. So after this whole idea of reckoning yourself dead to sin, but alive to God, Paul immediately goes on and says, let not therefore sin reign in your mortal bodies to obey it in its lusts. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think there's several things in that verse that immediately say, hey, look, we've got to move from just reckoning. That's key. Who we mm-hmm. are in Christ, that's key. But immediately then we go beyond that and, and continue to fight against sin. And just the, the, the first two words of that verse are so interesting where he says, let us not. And uh, that immediately it touches the will of the individual and says, look, you actually have to to do something here. Uh, You have to make a choice not to let sin reign. Uh, And that means initially, just before we even get to the whole offensive thing, that means saying no. That means just putting up a defensive stand uh, against sin. Uh, Secondly, I think what's so interesting about that verse, he says, let not sin therefore reign in your mortal bodies. And this is where we want to pay attention, I think, to language, because there is a world of difference between uh, sin reigning in our lives and us having to battle sin. Mm. So we can't stop what is a guerrilla warfare um, with sin. So uh, throughout the Christian life, and, and we want to be so clear with these podcasts, we're not giving guys a recipe for absolute victory where the, the fight is going to stop and you're going to have peace. But what the gospel does tell us is we can't let sin reign uh, because it's not our master. And so uh, guys need to ask that question. Are they just letting pride or anger or lust uh, have mastery over them? Because the gospel doesn't let us be in that position of submitting to sin in that way. So, you know, let not sin therefore reign. And just that the the last part, I think that's so important about that verse is Paul says um, to make you obey its, its passions or its lusts. And so, you know, what this is telling us is that really the battle, ultimately this battle, it's something that involves our desires, our passions, lusts, the human heart. And whereas our culture right now often tells us, 
uh, just to, to be true to ourselves, mm -hmm. you know, to kind of look inward, act off our appetites, our desires, that that's a, a totally different worldview from the Christian worldview, which tells us, no, actually, we've got to filter our passions. And there are some passions that rise in the heart. And the only thing to do, if we can't kill them initially, we got to at least say no to them and not submit to them. And so that's what we're saying. That's what it looks like to put up a defensive stand against sin. Yeah, I think especially when you talk about what the modern culture will tell us, you said, you know, it's always, hey, go follow the passions of your heart or whatever desires you feel are okay. And that is a, opposes uh, not only this verse, but I think through, here's another verse for you. First Peter 2.11, beloved, I urge you as sojourners and exiles to abstain. Now that's, that's a hard word these days, right, Joe? To yeah. abstain from the passions of the flesh which wage war against your soul. And there's that wage war. That's, that's some offensive language. That's, that's hard language. Yeah. So there it is again, this idea of abstaining, saying no to something. This is right. actually something we're supposed to do, right? right. Uh, so this is, this is hard for guys, I think, because we are kind of built in with this mindset of whatever I feel, go with it, whatever, I, you know, culture will tell you whatever passions or desires are good. But this says, wait, wait, abstain from the passions of the flesh. That's that's harsh language, right? Well, it is. And, uh, you know, I think often we're idealistic with spirituality. So, it's... you know, we, we want to talk about, you know, being able to like fulfill our passions and, and you know, find our delight in God. And all of that is great. We want to get to that place. But in the moment of war, it may be a moment where you're not there where you can delight yet in God. And all you can do is say no to what you know is an obstacle to delighting in God. And so that's just the realist position that um, ultimately I should find my satisfaction in God. Right now, man, I just want to pound a few beers and just forget about my problems. But I'm going to say no. I'm going to say no to that desire, even though maybe that was who I was, you know, as a non-Christian. And that's how I coped with uh, stress. But I'm going to say no and just trust that over time God's going to grow me up and I'm going to find delight in better things. That's great. Yeah, that, that is wonderful. What are some, let, let's talk just some more about practical implications for the day-to-day -day life of how, how do guys actually do this? How does one play defense aside from just say no, which is huge. I mean, just learning that you can and should say no. What are other practical implications for how to play defense in the day-to-day -day when you're fighting sin? Yeah, I think, uh, one is to just realize sin is weakest at its first movement. Um, so there's a kind of downward uh, gravity that comes with temptation, and it's, it sort of builds and accumulates um, as you countenance a temptation. And so whenever, whenever you feel yourself tempted, if, if you can immediately respond forcefully, uh, you're in a better position than if you wait and kind of think and kind of play around. So, you know, an example of that would be you think of Eve in the garden. Um, you know, what would have been the best moment to, uh, you know, to resist the temptation that the serpent was putting toward her as soon as she heard the lie, not to stare at the fruit and think, man, that looks good. That looks <laughs> real good. Um, you know, it would have been to say, no, I'm going to avert my eyes. I'm going to move to the other part of the garden. Um, I'm going to go, you know, whatever, wherever I need to do, mm -hmm. that's the critical moment. And if you fall, you know, if you let yourself, you know, just entertain the temptation, then all of a sudden, you know, you start to go down that slippery slope and you just kind of find yourself um, all of a sudden your, your self-control just evaporating, you know, as you as you are waiting to act. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. I would I would add to that that guys need to pay attention to both their their habits and their habitats. So I think that the, the daily habits you have, your routines are a great way to set up some defenses against sin but also your habitat or your environment. I think environment plays huge into playing defense against sin. We rarely recognize um, how quickly we can give in to things because of the way we've set up our lives through our daily routines or lack thereof and through the ways we surround ourselves. So we think about even just uh, uh, things like digital minimalism, right? Right. This is a big right. picture. This is a hot topic, even just outside of Christianity. People are saying, this is something we probably need to attach ourselves to because if you give yourself free 
access to your phone, to your computer, to all these things all day, it doesn't produce anything <laughs> all that great. So even just saying, okay, I'm going to have a habit of turning my phone off at a certain time, or I'm going to have, have a habit of you know, limiting my time on my phone to one hour a day, whatever. Um, and even just thinking then about the habitat. So why, why should we take our phone into the locked room of our bathroom where the one place where we're okay to be private, right? It's okay right. to be private alone and no one's going to question you. No one's going to come peek over your shoulder. No one's there. And you know, no one's there. Yeah. Maybe we should think about that habitat, that environment maybe is a little too easy to scroll through and see something that would be because no one is definitely going to be looking over your shoulder during that time. Maybe just don't even bring it into that habitat. Don't let things yeah. like that live in that. So I think paying attention to your environment, paying attention to your routines and setting up uh, healthy routines is a great way to play defense uh, when we're yeah. talking about fighting sin. When I think, I think what you're, what you're talking about is, is really important because uh, there, there's been a tendency, I think in some Christian circles over the last 10 or 15 years to, to, to focus rightly on the heart hmm. and the way in which, you know, sin ultimately is a problem of the heart is a heart issue. It's a worship issue. And ultimately it's an idolatry issue. And uh, you know, as people talk about that, what they sometimes talk about is look, don't pay attention to the superficial stuff. You just need to get to the heart of the problem. And if you get to the heart, then, you know, that's the only way transformation is going to result. And I think what we need to say is that's a, that's a yes, but sort of thing. Like I totally affirm that that's true. That's the heart of the issue, but it's an idealistic approach. The truth is that our heart is affected by our environment is affected by our habitat, as you said. And so if we're going to really deal with the heart, that means not being negligent in terms of our habitat. And so, you know, what guys need to think about is yes, how do we get to the heart of the issue, but equally everything you're saying, how do we set ourselves up? Mm -hmm. So we're not going to fail, you know, when we don't need to. And I think if we look around, we're going to see ourselves. I mean, it's like the guy who struggles with vanity, um, who's just sitting there doing curls in the, in the weight room in front of the mirror, staring at himself. It's like, you know, like, <laughs> yeah, you know, that you're, you're just going to, you're going to, you're feeding the problem and um, taking the mirror mirrors away. Right it's not going to remove the sin, but it's not going to feed the sin in the same way either. Yeah. Uh. Yeah, that's great. That's really good. <laughs> uh, one other thing I'd add just as a, a practical thing for guys, we look, we spent a whole 10 episodes in our last season talking about spiritual friendship. And uh, I don't want to, you know, repeat everything we said, but friends, spiritual friends are a great way to help you play defense against sin. Confessing to, to your friends, the sin that you are struggling with or keep falling into, or like I've got, um, I've got a group of friends that when we sit down at the beginning of the year and, uh, we're looking at the year ahead of us, you know, everybody has a habit of making goals, setting yeah. up, you know, here's what I even just looking at your calendar. Here's the things I'm looking forward to this year. Here's the things I want to accomplish this year. And, uh, so I've got some buddies when we've done that, uh, tried to ask the question, okay, now looking at what I want to accomplish, looking at what's on my calendar, we ask, what is the sin that is most likely to de derail me? What's the sin that's most likely to get in the way of me actually accomplishing? It? Just trying to, that's a, hey, let's think ahead, right? Let's identify that because with each of us, it's probably something a little bit different. But then the, the follow-up question there would be, how can I change my habits and my habitats to guard against that sin? How can I set yeah. up now some guards, start to play defense ahead of time so that I don't get derailed? And I think just even having those kind of conversations with your friends to put it outside yourself, go ahead, put it out there. This is a sin I struggled. I am struggling with. This is a sin I failed in. This is one that is going to derail me. Let's talk about that. I think embracing those spiritual friendships is huge in playing defense. Yeah. And I would really encourage guys, uh, something to just keep an eye out for is when you begin to delight in sin, then it's definitely something to confess to somebody. So what I mean by that is, um, like, okay. So, so you struggle with lust. Everybody struggles with lust. You know, you, you, every guy's needing to turn his eyes, make sure he's not focusing. But then there's that, there's maybe that moment where there's a particular woman who you let yourself kind of think about and you're enjoying the lust, you're not resisting it, mm -hmm. or it can be anything. Um, you know, it can be, uh, um, 
again, the sort of, so the sort of pride you find yourself with success and you're just daydreaming and you know, it's getting to your head. Now you're delighting in that kind of self-centeredness. And whenever sin gets to that place where like with Eve, she saw the fruit and it looked good. Hmm. That's the problem. And that's where we, you want to bring somebody else in because at that point you can't trust in your own strength to play defense against the sin. It's conceived in a way in your heart that's really deadly. And so, uh, you know, confess to a friend if you are taking delight in sin. And then with that, something I know that we've done a lot with, with guys with cross training is I would just encourage guys, if they want to play defense, memorize scripture. Yeah. Um, you know, we take guys through Colossians 3. And uh, part of that chapter, Paul has a couple of lists of sin. One kind of dealing roughly with lust, another kind of broadly with anger. But consistently, as guys memorize those uh, verses, which are unusual memory verses, because guys don't typically, uh, well, even Sunday school classes, you don't memorize list of vices, right? <laughs> um, but what happens is because you have these lists in your head, um, you know, all of a sudden in that moment, you, 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 you know, look at a woman and you hear Paul speaking in your ear, put to death, therefore, you know, uh, what is earthly in you, sexual immorality. And it's like, whoa, <laughs> you know, I just hit a trip line. Um, <laughs> So uh, memorizing scripture is a great defensive tactic to, to remind you of the need to play defense. Yeah, that's great. Uh, let me put before us now a particular sin. I want to, in each episode, uh, try to show, hey, this, this is real and this can work. Um, so let's talk about pride. You want to, man, you want to talk about sins that guys are passive with, sins that, that just have, are so prolific so all consuming and everywhere that we've just kind of taken the attitude of is it, it is what it is. And uh, I don't know that there's anything I could do if I, I know with every like small group or accountability relationship I've ever had, if a guy is ever asked, you know, what are you struggling with this week? And they just are coming up blank for whatever reason. They just go to pride. They just it's the go to right. spot. right? <laughs> so we right. all struggle with pride. Let's start with at least just a, a shared definition of pride. How would you define yeah pride for guys if they're going to fight it. Yeah. Uh, CJ Mahaney, he's got a book on humility. I think he does a great job. He just says contending with the supremacy of God. Hmm. Um, that's what pride is. And, and there's kind of two things there. One, uh, wanting the status of God and secondly, refusing to depend upon God, those two aspects. And what's great is, I mean, part of, part of killing sin is making sin ugly and appalling and detestable. And often pride doesn't look that bad. I mean, most of the people we worship as celebrities and entrepreneurs, et cetera, they're all really proud people. Mm -hmm. So we, we can't take for granted that we even hate pride, like, like we may hate other sin. So, you know, you've got to have a definition that makes you see why it's evil. And I think if we realize that when, when, I, when I indulge in pride, basically I'm saying, Jesus, could I knock you off the throne? Um, you know, I'd like to sit in that seat, please. And you know what, God, I don't want to depend upon you. I'm competent to provide for my own needs. Thank you very much. So basically <laughs> we're adopting the mindset of Satan, you know? So if you think of it that way, um, that this is satanic, all of a sudden it makes it look a little bit less appealing and you feel your heart kind of like, okay, I, I need to deal with this. Yeah. Gosh. Uh, yeah. That sounds overwhelmingly, uh, that sounds terrible and something. Yeah. I'm like, okay, I need to fight. You've just convinced <laughs> yeah. me, Joe, I need to start fighting and, uh, and put up some defense. I think for uh, myself, I, did you play basketball growing up at all? I did, I did play basketball. Yeah. Right, you seem, you kind of look like a basketball player. Uh, we'll have to play sometime if you ever, you know, are in town, <laughs> but I grew up playing basketball. All right. Um, and I remember I had a coach uh, around junior high that uh, gave me one of the best tips for defense in basketball ever. So if you grew up, you may remember, know this as well. This is around junior high where not everybody's great, but uh, you know they, they've learned the basics. And he said, look, most guys are right-handed. And so if you will just shut down the whole right side of the court and just yeah. basically play on the right-hand side, let them go forward. That's fine. They can't finish on their left. They'll never finish a left-handed layup. No junior high kid can do a left-handed layup. Yeah. You know? So if you'll just stand on their right side, you have shut them down. They, they just, they're less likely to actually be able to move forward and do anything. You've taken away the majority of their game. If you'll just do that one simple thing. And it's, it's totally true. It works. It's a great little trick, but I think about this in my life of pride as well. I think, you know, I can analyze my life and say, you know, pride is at its best when, you know, a basketball player, junior high basketball player is at his best when he's dribbling with his right hand. But if you can shut down that right hand, 
he's less likely to be successful. I think we can think the same way about pride. Pride in my life, I have evidence that it's at its best when, and we could probably all fill that blank in with something different. For me, you know, pride is at its best when I'm monologuing a lot of times, you know? So I've had to uh, try to say, you know what? I need to ask more questions. I, I, if I'm in a conversation or something, don't, don't hog it. Like as, be pointed about asking questions, be curious. Cause Evan, when you start to monologue, you start to think you're awesome. You start to think you're the best, you know, you pride wells up. So I need to shut down that half of the court and say, yeah. I'm gonna ask questions and not, you know, monologue. So I don't know. I think that's one way to, for us to think about playing defense. There's strategy there, shut down, identify how does pride play out in your life and shut down that half of the court so that it has less of a chance of succeeding. You're not going to totally defeat it, maybe, but you'll have, you will, you know, at least play some good defense there. I don't know. What are some other ways for you? How, how have you fought pride? Yeah. I, I want to be really honest with guys because uh, this is, this is the godfather of sin. I mean, this is, this is the capital, the head, um, and you can trace every other sin to it. So I don't want to give guys the impression that this is at all an easy battle. This is, this is the hardest one. Um, I think for, for me, um, there's a, not guys may not know Carl Henry, but he was a key kind of uh, church evangelical figure in the 20th century, wrote tons of books, famous, uh, for a lot of reasons, started all kinds of movements. Um, and somebody once asked him the question, how he, uh, fought pride. And, uh, his answer was no, no man can stand near the cross and feel proud. And so what he was saying was that he had to stay close to the cross. I think for me, this is where uh, really meditating. I mean, there's one particular hymn that I love. It's, it's my, these are my favorite words uh, that aren't in the Bible. And just when I survey, but that first stanza is talked about when I survey the wondrous cross on which the Prince of glory died, my richest gain, I count, but loss and poor contempt on all my pride. And what that song is telling us is the way you deal with pride is you sit and you survey the cross. Hmm. And that means like looking at it. Um, part of the dish issue with pride is it eats anything. It doesn't just eat like the secular success we have. It actually eats up all the stuff we do in cross training. Where we're getting guys to memorize scripture and like wake up. Pride can feed off that stuff. And the only way to, uh, to escape is, you know, when you look at Jesus on the cross and realize this is the sum total of my life, my good deeds, my bad deeds. Um, I, the son of God had to die for me. That's, that's in a sense, my, my self-worth in and of myself. And yet, and yet he's doing it for me. And so I have worth, but I have worth because he loves me. It's not what I've achieved. It's not what I've accomplished. Um, it's because I'm loved by him in this way. And, uh, you know, as you sit there, you know, that's that place of humility and it's only the ground of humility on which pride cannot grow. So, um, I know most guys will not have done this, but I think to, to really think about what it means to meditate on the cross, uh, whether it's through scripture, through using old hymns, um, but it's going to be really keeping your eyes on Jesus, uh, that you're going to find yourself being able to put, uh, pride to death. Yeah, I, there's zero I can add to that, Joe. That's I, I we got to end there because yes, no man can feel pride when sitting next to the cross. That's what I want guys to go and do this week. Guys, go meditate on all of that that Joe is just yeah. Find a hymn, find scripture, man. Sit next to the cross and good luck with pride after that. So yeah, that's yeah, that's a yeah. a great uh, place for us to end, uh, guys. I'd encourage you if you're looking for next steps. This is. You probably notice you ain't going to kill sin in just this one episode, right? right? We want to help you begin to develop a lifestyle of putting Christ first. So you can go to survivingthetrenches.men, and that's where you'll find more information on how to fight sin. And you can get the book, Surviving the Trenches. You can get a 10-week challenge that you can do with your friends to help uh, you start doing this together. Uh, but yeah, we want you to know that, look, fighting sin obviously is nothing like cooking a rotisserie chicken. So uh, That's right. <laughs> let's, let's go out there and get to work and uh, we'll see you guys next week.